Welcome everyone to the Chenri Z Empowerment with Lama Jampa. And Lama Jampa is already here. Hello, Lama. Hello, Lama. Good afternoon for you. Good afternoon. Yeah, I think we don't have any announcement or so. So, uh, yeah, Lama, whenever he would like to start. Yeah, except for our translator is safely already linked. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> Translation is here. If you need a Spanish translation, you can access it through the interpretation channels. Okay, well, so welcome to the uh, blessing of Avalokiteshvara. Uh, it, it's not a, a full initiation. Um, and just a small note is, is that if you have an Anatara Yoga initiation, uh, I will identify, you can identify with Avalokiteshvara as he uh, was called a Jaina or permission continues. If you've never received an Anatara Yoga initiation, uh, then basically you just visualize them in your crown or in your heart. And I'll describe all of that as the, as the time progresses. So, uh, but first we're gonna talk about uh, motivation because uh, motivation is what's creating us. You know, how we motivated five years ago, how we motivated last year, how we motivated this morning is, is the creator of who we are. So uh, it's really important to recognize that. And, uh, you know, if you've been practicing for five or 10 or 15 years, uh, often, you know, you can get a little bit lazy about motivation because, you know, you, you say the prayer, you know, I mean, I go for refuge, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, for now until enlightenment, you know, I work for the benefit of all sentient beings. But the uh, reality is, is that you really didn't generate any feelings. You just rattled off the words. So not very beneficial. So um, I'm going to introduce, uh, uh, let's say, the way that I was taught by Trichang Rinpoche, Kyoshi Trichang Rinpoche, uh, in one of, one of the initiations. I, I wasn't often, but I periodically translated for him for teachings and initiations. So he always said, uh, when you when you generate bodhicitta, I mean, yes, you're doing it for the benefit of all sentient beings, but you start off with people that are close to you, so family or close friends, uh, whatever seems most appropriate. And so in that thought, then, um, if you do that, for example, let's say I bring to mind, you know, my family, and then I say, okay, this is for the benefit of them. Okay, I have in my heart a warm feeling. I have my love, so I'm accumulating that karma. And then I have that I'm attending a teaching, uh, going towards enlightenment. So I have that karma. So then you're getting a much more full package of karma compared to just saying, oh, you know, I want to become enlightened. And the object in your mind is just you. So uh, these are really little, little points, but they're important because if you put five or 10 or 15 years of life into your practice, you want it to affect you. You know, you don't want to sort of say, gee, nothing's happening anymore. Well, if nothing's happening, chances are you're not motivating correctly and, and practicing with mindfulness. So um, for this, then, you know, I, I sometimes I thought like, okay, well, y'all yeah, motivate for you know my wife, you know, may I, may, may I offer a more enlightened relationship? But you know, adults are more complicated, and what you what we want to do is to generate a quite pure feeling. I mean, a really good feeling. I mean, it's with just no strings attached. Just I really want to benefit. So uh, depending on who you are, uh, if you're old enough, then maybe you have grandchildren, uh, maybe you have nieces and nephews, or just you, you can think of a, a young child, maybe four or five, six years old. And, you know, if, especially if you've got some love for that child, then, you know, you really would like to offer a good relationship to them. And so that object is quite pure because there's no expectations. You know, generally speaking, children aren't too complicated. So basically, uh, you can have like, oh, you know, so in your in your this bring to mind uh, a child that you know that you happen to care about, and if there's a feeling of joy and love in your heart when you think of them, then just surround say, I'm attending this teaching for them. I would like to offer a more enlightened relationship to this child. And in that way, then you really, you've created some very good karma. And of course, then you can expand it and say for the benefit of all sentient beings. But if you start to create a karma, you know, like create uh, this type of feeling and intention, it'll grow. And then you can apply it to people that are complicated and you don't have a, you don't, let's say, have complications about it because you learned how to do, you know, a very pure emotion. 
so uh, for, for attending these teachings. And uh, as I say, please motivate in a manner that, that has a warm feeling to it. And you do that. Um, you know, if you think about it, how do you have feelings? Will you invoke them? So you bring to mind someone that you love comes and comes love. You bring you, you visualize them or you bring them to mind. So, you know, you invoke love. It's not like you just sit there and say love. You know, you have an object and then love arises. So in that way, then please motivate with the uh, wish to be of benefit to sentient beings. And of course, I mean, off of the way I just described it. And then, uh, although we're, we're all over the, the universe, <laughs> in one way, um, in front of you, you can feel that you have Avalika Deshvara, uh, you know, it, it just you know, floating above your computer screen or something like that, you know, and he's looking at you quite, quite uh, well, compassionately. He likes you. Uh, and with that, then, um, please, can we uh, share the, do the screen share for Refuge, Bodhicitta, and Mandela, and that way we can all do it, although... You're going to do it in your own space without without your microphone, but uh, we can do it. So with have a Lakedish bar in front of us, within our heart, the feeling of we're doing this for more than just ourselves. We're attending this teaching to become be able to offer a more enlightened relationship. So the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Community, I turn for refuge until my enlightenment. By the merits of practicing generosity and other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all. To the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Community, I turn for refuge until my enlightenment by the merit of practicing generosity and other perfections. May I become a Buddha for the benefit of all. To the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Community, I turn for refuge until my enlightenment by the merit of practicing generosity and other perfections. May I become a Buddha to benefit all. May all sentient beings have happiness in its causes. May all sentient beings be free of suffering in its causes. May all sentient beings not be separated from joy beyond sorrow. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment and aversion to attractive and repulsive people. The earth purified with scented waters, strewn with flowers, adorned with sun, Sirmu, the king of mountains, the four quarters of the universe, the sun and the moon, I hold up and envision as a pure land paradise and offer so that beings may experience their world as a paradise. By the virtue of this offering, may all beings here and now attain the happiness of the pure land. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Nir Tayami. Okay, so um, I remember that the, the uh, when I took when you take teachings, you know, if you've lived in India and you've been with the Tibetan Lamas, you know, they have your ear now. Because <laughs> you're excited to attend an initiation, so they're going to give you the Dharma. <laughs> so anyway, I, I'm going to do the same because that was how I was taught. But I'd like to make it uh, interesting for us. So um, the the Bay, like Avalokiteshvara, is for personification of what? He is a personification of love, but love is based on what? Empathy. You know, I, I had sometimes used to think about how is it that the the Buddhas, the fully enlightened Buddhas you know, have a spontaneous response to us. Well, they cultivated empathy, you know, empathy in response with love and compassion. And so by cultivating it first as just a regular person and sort of as a, uh, on the first and second, you know, paths of the five paths, and then finally they became a bodhisattva after the path of seeing, uh, then they basically start to, you know, have it, like, they would see somebody empathize, appreciate their situation, and then respond with intelligence. And that's really important. Um, if you have too much empathy, you're just going to you know, cry and sob all the time. Actually, um, Komal Rinpoche, who was one of the translators in the Tibetan library back in the 1970s, uh, he was known as the crying bodhisattva in his previous life. It said that he, he would see somebody and burst into tears and sob piteously. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I guess he had a massive empathy and, and you know, of course, then from the Buddhist point of view, he was seeing that this person, you know, wanted to be happy and didn't like to suffer, but didn't have all the proper techniques. So you could say his empathy was in that category. So em empathy is really important, but of course, empathy with intelligence, like if you over empathize, you will get too emotional. And as you get older, actually, it happens to you naturally as sort of my experience. I mean, uh, anyway, so <laughs> the point is, is that to cultivate, uh, to recognize you see somebody 
and you appreciate maybe some dynamic about them. I remember there was a, a story of actually of a Hindu guru, and I remember it's a Ramana, Ramanan, Ramanan something, or Sri Ramanan or something. He was in Calcutta. Anyway, and uh, so he was walking with his students, and uh, there up in front of them, there was a man who had a horse, and he was beating the horse with a stick. And you know, in India, you know, they 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 were, were just a little longy on the on the thing, so you know, just the upper chest was bare. And one of his students observed that with every time the hit the stick hit the horse, a welt appeared on his guru's back. And, and you know, we might say, oh wow, you know, he's taking on the karma of that. No, he's just got incredible empathy. And you know, I might say just from that, then huge love comes out of him for the horse and a wish to sort of help the, the man realize that he's hurting the horse and stuff like that. So that, and then there's a story of in Tibet, there was a Tibetan Lama giving a, a discourse uh, in a temple that was open on the sides and uh, there was a dog outside and someone threw a rock and hit the dog in the side and the Lama went, oh, like that, but then continued teaching and then later there was a bruise on his, on his chest where, where the dog had been hit by a rock. Empathy. Now that's really powerful empathy, uh, but the thing is it's tied together with a lot of wisdom that there's this, okay, you know, I, I am, you know, connected to the universe around me. So when stuff happens, it's going to affect me, but I'm not going to get emotional or get neurotic or crazy. I'm just going to say, okay, my, may my love and compassion go to that, that dog or go to that person that created that, that harm. And, and one thing, you know, in our culture nowadays, uh, we have so much news. I mean, what's going on with, uh, with Israel? What's going on in the Ukraine? I mean, so sad. And you have to be a little bit careful of taking in too much information because, you know, they do say we get desensitized. But the, the bottom line is, is, is that if you do care, you might end up making yourself really feeling miserable. And then what you've done is your empathy has not been beneficial. It's, it's a, you can say, unbeneficial empathy. So you want to be careful of that. But Empathy, which then cognizes another person's situation, whatever, and then responds with wisdom and skillful means. Um, you know, I often think of like great bodhisattvas. They have to be so flexible and so adaptable because there's so many weird sentient beings out there. And, you know, and if they're a really good bodhisattva, they, they'd like to be a benefit. So they have to have these incredibly flexible minds of which... For me, uh, Lama Yeshi was the epitome of that. He just was so incredible. You know, I, I in the first few years before he uh, got really popular and traveled the world, I mean, when he was in Dharamsala and, and at Tushita, where, where I was uh, staying, uh, you know, with the Dalai Lama, and that's, that's in Dharamsala, you know, he would, you know, he would, he would basically, you know, be with people. And, and on occasion, like he could, he could see, change his personality so much. And, but there was what's most interesting is that he would meet somebody and he'd shake their hand and say, hello, how are you, dear? You know, and this and that. And then after they were gone, he would just sort of turn to me and say, oh, well, that person has um, this problem. And I'd say, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting, you know. And I, I mean, if that person hung around long enough, you know, maybe a year or two in India, then sure enough, it showed, showed up like that. I remember there was one fellow that very devotionally became a monk. You know, he came to see Lama Yeshi. And uh, let me, as she, you know, said hello. And then the next time he came to see him, he sat there and he says, you're just after power. You're bad. You know, and then he was like, oh, how dare you? Know, I'm, I'm a monk, you know, I'm trying so hard. But it's true. I mean, later on, he became very arrogant. And then later on, he went off and he started his own little Dharma center. You know, I can't say really teaching Buddhism. And he was a bit of a bully, you know. So anyway, there, there's Lama Yeshi you could pick up on people incredibly. It's such a thing, but you know, I mean, he, you know, out of love, when he said that to that person, I think he was hopeful that that person might have a change of heart. Anyway, long and short of it is this is it. Uh, we're going to practice the practice of Avalokiteshvara, it is based on uh, Bodhicitta, Avalokiteshvara. The Dharmakaya of Avalokiteshvara is you know, open like the space of the sky, it's, it's a without form, a very subtle mind. But as soon as he starts to manifest like his astral body, you know, with the Sambhogakaya, it's out of love for sentient beings. That's why he manifests. He didn't do it for himself, you know. So he manifested. And then if he sees that there's sentient beings that need to be more helped, that don't, can't perceive a subtle body, he manifests as a full form. 
again, bodhicitta. So bodhicitta is really important. And with that, then I, I want to just quote from the um, uh, uh, Shantideva's Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. And if you, you know, if I could encourage you to do something, memorize uh, the first chapter. At least memorize from about verse 5 to verse 15, uh, because they're really meaningful. They're really beautiful and special. So uh, verse 5 of the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, and it's the one I have is from uh, uh, Stephen Batchelor did the translation. Leisure and endowment are very hard to find, and since they accomplish what is meaningful for humanity, if I do not take advantage of them now, how will the perfect opportunity come about again? Now, again, I don't don't be in a rush. Uh, you will get the initiation, but you know I, I'd like to inspire us a little bit. So, if you ever consider that most of us really don't remember our past life, you know, uh, we, we you know who we were, the name, the place we were born, none of those things. I'd say ninety percent of us, not maybe even ninety-eight percent of us, don't remember that. But in one way or another, we're affected by that person's activities. Not completely. You know, I mean, I was brought up in the 50s and 60s. You know, it was hippie time, make love, not war. It was really a fortunate time to be brought up, you know, other than the Vietnam War. But the thing is basically it was a good time. But I remember like I, when I was about 16, I saw a little Buddha statue with a little, little fat one, a Chinese or Japanese one with the arms up and a fat stomach. And when I bought it, the, uh, the lady said, oh, if you rub his belly, he'll make you happy. And I went, okay, and it was a keychain. So sure enough, I found, and I can remember back that I would be rubbing his belly a lot. And so I get, where did that come from? Well, I guess some karma for being a Buddhist. So if we think of our next rebirth, that person will not know you for nothing. They will not know your name, that you were whatever country you are brought in, or whether you're a man or a woman, they won't know anything about you. But they will be affected by how you acted and how you lived your life. And so, you know, we always hear, you know, work for the future life, but no, I'd like to rephrase that. Think of that this rebirth is the opportunity to send Christmas presents to that next rebirth or to spend gifts. Because if you do a good job or a reasonably good job in relationships, that person's gonna have a reasonably good job in relationship. If you do a, a practice or are generous, that person will have abundance, uh, like will not have, as, you'll just have abundance in their life because you created abundance by being generous or whatever. I mean, if you have ethics, you know, if you, you have a uh, ethics, ethics in Buddhism is if you don't want something done to yourself, harmful, don't do it to others, you know, so don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. If you don't want the, if you don't want those things done to you, don't do them to others. So that is ethics. So if you do those things, you're making some beautiful gifts for that next person. And if they became a Buddhist, or at least they heard about past lives, they might say, wow, thank you so much. Of course, you could apply the opposite and saying, you know, oh, <laughs> I've had a horrible time in my relationships, you know, or does this suck? Well, you can say, well, the, the twit behind me did the same thing, you know? So, hey, I have an opportunity to improve that. So leisure and diamond are hard to find. I mean, that, that's leisure is, you know, you, you meet with, well, leisure is that you have the freedoms. And Dhammas, you've met Buddha Dharma, you've met the teachings. And, and wow, we're so lucky. Buddhism is so intelligent. I mean, it's, it's psychologically very beautiful. It's philosophically in the nature of reality really well. We are so lucky, you know, that's endowment. And they're not easy to find. I mean, it could have been something got in the way and you didn't meet it. And since they accomplish what is meaningful for, for us, for humanity, or whatever, for all sentient beings, if I don't take it now, how will perfect I come again? And then the next verse I really like is, just as a flash of lightning on a dark cloudy night, for an instant brightly illuminates all. Likewise, the world, through the might of Buddha, a wholesome thought rarely and briefly appears. And you have to think about that. Is it, that, you know, really, and if you took an average day, how many virtuous <laughs> thoughts arise, you know, it, you know, it's sort of like, oh, why did that person cut me off in their car? And that person's driving too fast. And that person's rude. And I don't know, just so, I mean, those are our, most of our thoughts, you know, whereas, you know, really having a, uh, uh, you know, a wholesome thought, not very often. And we're so lucky that Buddha Shakyamuni 2,500 years ago came and had a big flash of lightning that like on a dark floating night, which is samsara a flash of lightning, Buddha Shakyamuni, and not based on faith, based on intelligence and, and good understanding. And, and so, wow, I mean, we're so, so we, so it really, really is. 
Okay, so, and then hence, and number seven, hence virtue is perpetually feeble the great sense of immortality or immorality is extremely intense. So except by the fully awakened mind, but what other virtue will come and overcome? Now, we're going to talk about that more when we move into bodhicitta. But you really have to think about like, okay, aren't we, if we're, if we're not in Israel or in Ukraine and maybe on some other basis, well, we're really lucky because there's a lot of heavy negativity going on and really suffering and violence. And so if we're in a reasonably peaceful country, we're so lucky. You know, we have a good circumstance and things. But in that circumstance, again, hey, take advantage of it. Do something. And fully awakened mind, the, the bodhicitta, it, it's the best. And if you think about bodhicitta, it, it's like if you took your body and your body was acidic, okay? Uh, if you develop bodhicitta, it's like it's alkaline. It, 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 it's, it, it neutralizes the acid. So in the same way, if you have bodhicitta, you know, may all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May all sentient beings free of suffering and the cause of suffering. Those thoughts, I mean, you're not going to go out and kill or steal or lie or, or things, I mean, maybe periodically because of some misunderstanding or lack of attention. But basically, you won't. You've changed the chemistry of your body. You've changed the, 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 the way that you interact. So if you really have sincere feelings in bodhicitta, May all sentient beings, even the really horrible ones that do horrible things, may they, you know, be free of their suffering, of their misunderstanding of reality. May they find real causes for happiness. I mean, they're looking for happiness in all the wrong way by malign and violence. So like that. So if you have those feelings that you created yourself, that you might say you you've stopped the alkal the acid nature of your being and you become more alkaline. And that's just what's the thought. I mean, that's just that feeling in you makes you an example is alkaline or neutral okay all buddhists have contemplated for many eons and seem to be beneficial for those for, for by the limitless masses of beings that quickly attain extreme state of bliss okay <clears throat> the other there's uh the you know, I, I like the idea that the buddhas you know they have an omniscient mind so they can look and they see someone's rebirth for like you know a hundred rebirths and they say well well they practice yoga and they practice tai chi and then they they did meditation and this and that you know, and they see how they progressed. And then they see somebody that, that okay, did meditation or whatever, but they had bodhicitta. And then they go, whoo, that person took off like a skyrocket, you know. And they say, whoa, it's all the Buddhas who have contemplated for many eons, the sentient beings, see that if you have bodhicitta, it's been beneficial. By, lim by limitless masses of beings will quickly attain the supreme state of bliss. So that's sort of like, okay, if I'm doing yoga, just add bodhicitta to it. If I'm doing Tai Chi, add bodhicitta to it. If, I, if my job's a sales clerk in a store, add bodhicitta to it. You know, and how may I help you? That's what you say to a client. You know, maybe you're just going to give them uh, something simple, or maybe you can help them go all the way to enlightenment. It's so easy, you know. So it's not easy. Well, it's, it's good. So those who wish to destroy the many sorrows of their conditioned existence, and those who wish to be all beings to experience multiple joys, and those who wish to experience happiness should never forsake the awakened mind. Okay, so if you start to develop the awakened mind, you will start to destroy the conditions of, of or the sorrows of conditioned existence. You know, as it says in the uh, Lama Chopa uh, verse, you know, it, you know, the, the, although su suffering rains down intensively, may I have the attitude that realizing that if, the, if I'm having some problems and sufferings, if I can accept it and respond in a constructive, positive way, I purified that karma. It won't come back. I broke the cycle. You know, we all know that. I mean, from, you know, people that are born into violent families, there's a cycle that they all again go into violence. But if you can break it, okay, so the same thing. If you if you wish to destroy the many sorrows of your conditioned existence and you wish to experience multitudes of joy, those who wish to experience much happiness should never forsake the awakening mind. And what is joy? I, I mean, I was... I was thinking about it in terms of where do we have, like, you know, we, we, we especially if you practice tantra, we always talk about bliss, you know, like, oh, bliss, bliss, you know. But where do you get the greatest sense of bliss? And in this case, joy, joyful bliss. It's when you do something nice for somebody with no strings attached. It's like, you know, whether it's a child or somebody, uh, you know, you, you give them a present and you see them like, oh, and they like, and then you, you feel this sort of happiness inside. But it's when you do something for somebody else, 
it's sort of in a, you know, in a nice way and stuff that you do experience joy. And especially if it's something really meaningful, then it's just very powerful. I mean, they, they really have bliss and joy. Okay. So bodhicitta is really the source of bliss. You know, I mean, and it, like, for example, let's say you do your tantric practice, okay, and you're you're into it and you're, you're doing the blisses or whatever you're going to be doing like that, you know, and you're doing it for yourself. Okay, well, yeah, you can get some attainments, and, you know, it might depend a bit on your personality. But let's just say you're doing those practices so that you can offer a more enlightened relationship to others. You have a different chemistry going on inside of you with that. You know, you was like, yeah, it's not just about me. Hey, I'd like to be a more benefit. Okay. And then when you have the bliss going down and a bliss coming up or whatever you're doing, it, you you will have a more beautiful bliss because it's not about you. It's about, you can say about love, you know? So very interesting about that, that, that really bodhicitta is experience of multitudes of joys. Okay. Okay, and then at verse 10 is just, you know, the, for the moment the awakened mind arises, those fettered and weak in the jail of cycle existence, they will be named the child of the Sugatas and be revered by both humans and the gods of the world. Okay, uh, now then here comes the, the verses of, I think there's five. Of them. De los, de unos, eh, versos muy interesantes. Okay, Spanish kicked in, sorry there. Okay, uh, all right, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, verse 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 are, are the, the, the examples. And these are the ones you really should memorize. I mean, really and truly and sincerely. You want to benefit yourself, memorize these. Okay. Just as the supreme gold-making elixir, which transforms the unclean body that we have taken into the priceless jewel of Buddha form, therefore firmly sees this awakened mind. I actually like to change that to say, just as the supreme gold-making elixir can transform karma we have to, the karma we have into the priceless karmas uh therefore it's firmly sees this mind so the example is really good i mean if you took a rock you know and now gold's worth like with one thousand two hundred dollars an ounce you know it's incredible and you painted it with this elixir it comes gold and say whoa that's pretty special you know okay if you took uh the uh, like even a little bit of generosity like this like you know you go to a store someone's in front of you're walking up and you open the door for them. Okay, that's that's nice. If you, I mean, Lama Zopa said this, and I used to sort of think it was a bit ridiculous, but I now actually believe in it, that open the door for all sentient beings. May all sentient beings arrive in happiness, you know, in a department store. <laughs> but anyway, but happiness of enlightenment, you know. You just turned a little itty-bitty karma into gold. You turned into bodhicitta. You just have to have that type of attitude. Now, you have to be, you know, I mean, it's not going to happen all the time, but if you start having that, you're going to start having happy thoughts and feelings. Bodhicitta really is just unbelievable. And it's not anything like, like you know, you sacrifice your to the world or something. I mean, you know, Mother Teresa is a great example, but just, you don't need to do that. You just have to have the attitude of, well, I'm doing this for more than myself. You know, I mean, I, I've often heard, like, I spent five years in retreat. I did two years of preliminary at Tushita and then three years on the side of the mountain up above Dharamsala in isolation. You know, I mean, I really think, oh, I didn't go crazy. Uh, but the thing is, is that then someone says, oh, that's not Boichita. You know, you have to be out there in the streets, you know. No, it's about attitude. If you can find a, if you can do periodically retreats where you really can work and develop a really good feeling. Of course, when we step back out into the world, it gets attacked by the different things we see. But if we can then sort of try to cultivate it and keep it going a little bit, it grows, you know, and then it becomes stronger. And then you do maybe become as good as Mother Teresa. But the point is, it's not like we have to be extreme or exaggerated. Granted, you know, if we have these feelings, be a little bit careful. You know, your, your empathy will start to affect you, and then you'll find yourself more affected by the whole things that you see. So that's where you've got to ex ex exhibit intelligence and also some calmness, some patience about things. You know, if you think about it again, like, I mean, you know, supposedly Buddhists are omniscient. So that means right now, wherever you are, the Buddhist consciousness is all around you. And I like to think of it as right next to your cheek, like the Buddhist consciousness of would liking to help you to become enlightened right next to your cheek. Okay, so when you're negative, it's not like the Buddhists pull away a little bit, because that means is that they don't have an ability to deal with negativity. Now, the Buddhas can stay right beside your cheek the whole time, even though if you're being obnoxious or rude. But they, if there's any opening that you might 
sort of realize, oh, that was not very nice. They're there, you know, the, you know, they can't do it for you, but they can certainly, you know, I mean, they say there's a dynamic, I mean, it was an enlightened activity, especially if you, you know, if we take refuge, you know, I mean, again, Alex Burson, he says, refuge is taking direction. So if you turn your mind in the direction of taking refuge, that is, Buddhas are inspiring, they're fully enlightened, they're wonderful, bodhisattvas are really incredible, you know, and then the Dharma helps me accomplish those things. If you put yourself in a direction, that means they can come back to you. They can interact with you. Compared to if like I'm looking over here and I'm looking over there, I haven't got a sense of direction about my life. So refuge really is, it's establishing a relationship with Buddha Dharma Sangha uh, with enlightened beings. So anyway, uh, this the the, the you know, karma. So that's verse eleven, verse twelve. Since the limitless mind of the soul guide of the world is upon through investigation, seen as precious, all beings wishing to be free of worldly abodes should firmly take hold of the precious mind. So that's the example where, like, I mean, Buddhists have observed that um, uh, uh, that like that they observe sentient beings rebirth by rebirth. And those ones that develops in bodhicitta, they took off really well. Verse 13, all other virtues are like plantain trees for they are bare fruit and they simply perish. Yet the perennial tree of awakening mind increasingly bears fruit and thereby flourishes without end. An example would be is like take a, I don't know, like a flower, you know, it grows and it creates some seeds, but then it dies, it doesn't do any more. Whereas you took an apple tree an apple tree grows and produces apples, but then it goes again and produces more apples. So bodhicitta is like it's like a perpetual motion machine. You know, like oh, I see somebody, I'm going to give them, you know, somebody on the street, and give them a dollar or a euro or something like that. That's one karma. But if you then say, well, ah, there's a person on the street, I'm going to give them a euro, but I'd love to be able to do that for all sentient beings. That's big karma. It's just the same same action. But you said, well, you know, may I become you know, wealthy enough that I can do this for everybody or do it in a skillful way, you know, instead of soup kitchens or something or whatever, or help those street people become more enlightened, you know, and whatever. Again, a little bit, you know, it's again, you have to be careful how you think about it, but bodhicitta creates karma that creates more karma. Now, if you practice generosity, you've created some karma. You might have some, you, know, you have some inclination towards doing it again because you accumulate a little bit of karma of being generous. But if you added bodhicitta to it, like you really greased that machine up, so it's really going to work well. So bodhicitta is really precious. So it, it's it's the it's the uh, it's like a perennial that just continually uh, produces fruit. I trust my, and when I trust myself to a brave man, when greatly afraid. By entrusting myself to the awakening mind, I shall be liber swiftly liberated. Even if I have committed extremely heavy wrongdoings, uh, by, why then will con conscious not devote himself to this? Now, the example for this I like is this is that let's say, you know, suddenly Superman becomes your buddy. And even if you have to go to a really bad part of town, Superman's there to protect you. Or let's see if we make it more, more thing like, let's say you have a, a really, you know, a fifth Dan black belt ninja guy and he's your buddy and you're going through a dangerous place in the world and stuff you don't need to worry too much because this guy's a fifth Dan black belt ninja he can he can take out the things he can you know stop the, the the people that would steal from you so what's that mean well samsara is a really difficult place but if you have bodhicitta in your heart even just a little bit you're protected because it's the way of responding to situations in a more constructive manner. So just as if you were hanging out with Superman, you'd feel greatly protected. So in the same way, if you hang out with your bodhicitta, you'll be greatly protected. Uh, and as I, I think uh, yesterday on the Milarepa initiation um, that was a few days ago, uh, you know, I talked about the, the red blessing cords that we often get. Well, the, the red color is considered love. Okay, and it's a, we can say it's the love of the of our gurus that have for us, so it has that. But the real meaning is, if you have love in your heart, you are protected from all harms. You know, for example, if a mother has a very naughty child, but she has a huge love, like I mean, think of a I don't know Mediterranean mama, you know, this like big thing, lots of love for her children and stuff like that. Even the child naughty, they don't get angry. I mean, maybe they look at you know thing, but basically they never lose their love. 
even though the child might do some really crazy stuff. So the same thing, if we have the love of bodhicitta in us, even though we have crazy things happen around us, we have a consistency. Anyway, so that's the, uh, that. Uh, then it says, just like the fire at the end of the age, it instantly consumes all great wrongdoings. The sun fanable advantages were taught by the disciples of Buna to the Lord, wise Lord Maitreya. So if you, I think that example is like, you know, if you do develop some bodhicitta, it's like you put an alkaline, solution into your body which is very acidic okay but if you really have a heart of bodhicitta then basically you really do consume your previous negativity and there's an example i think the uh uh in the what is it the eight verses of mind training and i can't remember the name of it there was one lama that was famous for his his commentary on that uh and in that, and, and it said that he lived in the mountains, I think up in Sukkim or Bhutan or something like that. But anyway, there was wolves in his area. But because he had such a loving heart, they all became his pets because of the nature of who he was. So, so like that, I mean, if, anyway, so it, it's uh, having bodhicitta doesn't mean you become the doormat of everybody, it doesn't mean everybody takes advantage of you because you exercise intelligence, but you never lose the inner feeling of who I am, where I'm coming from. What's the theme of my life? What's the what's the meaning of my life? You have that life rebirth by rebirth. Uh, okay, in brief, the awakening mind should be understood in two types. So, I mean, that's just that it carries on. Again, if you can memorize from verse, uh, what we had, verse five to verse uh, uh, 15, that would be good, or even verse 16, that would be really excellent, you know. So that's for the, uh, uh, that's for, the preliminary for <laughs> dating uh, this initiation uh, because it is all about love and compassion. Now, okay, and this is like, let me see, there's people have chats. Uh, okay, okay, there's a, okay, somebody was saying about Spanish, so don't need to worry about that. Okay, so now we're going to go into the initiation. Um, and so we did take uh, refuge and bodhicitta. Uh, so just a second here. Okay, so. We've got a really good rebirth. Again, I mean, when you really think about various religions, then they're all good. I mean, if anybody has a religion that is some sense of spirituality, they're very lucky compared to someone that's totally materialistic. Um, actually, I have a story for you because I've got enough time. I see it's only it's only 2.38 right now here. So uh, in Canada, I had a student. Her name was Dorothy, uh, Doris. And uh, she was so religious, you know, I mean, she'd do Ouija boards and tarot cards and stuff. And then she met us in our Dharma Dar Center that we had there. And so she started to practice and became very devoted as a Buddhist and stuff like that. It was really a wonderful woman. But her husband was the antithesis. It was sort of such an interesting relationship that, you know, I mean, uh, he says, when I die, I'm going to become dirt. You know, it's, that's all there is to it. You know, there's nothing, you know. I mean, I guess he was still a reasonably nice guy, but he didn't have any sense of anything, any continuity about himself. Anyway, and so, you know, that's fine. Doris came to the Dharma Center for years and uh, meditated and such. And, you know, he was a nice enough man. But anyway, then one day he, he got sick. And so they took him to the local hospital and he had stomach problems. So they, they cut him open to see what was going on. And he was totally riddled with cancer, just really, really bad. Anyway, and so they stitch him back up and they put him back in the recovery ward and something like that. And actually, Doris was a nurse. Not that she was nursing for him, but uh, she's retired by then. But she was a nurse, so she knew all about hospitals. So she came in to see him. And and so it, so you have to think, think she, she comes in and he says, Doris, Doris. And he takes her hand and he says, Doris, he says, please forgive me. Forgive me for what? Well, when I was on the operating table, I got out of my body and I was looking down at all these doctors doing their stuff on me and this and that. And and, and there was I was there's I was like on my body watching it. And she said, Wow. And she says, Yeah. And he says, So all those years I criticized you and abused you about there's no spirituality in life. You know, please forgive me. I was so I was so rude to you. Please forgive me. And she said, Okay, no, of course, you know, I love you and my husband. And then he said, but I have one more thing, you know, that whilst I was there, a voice came and said that tonight I'm going to die. And so I can sort of get emotional. Um, anyway, so she said, what are you talking about? And he says, well, no, it's just that I could, this voice told me I'm going to die. You know, and then I was back in my body and I'm sitting here talking to you. 
Anyway, and so uh, she said, oh, really? You know, so she went up to the doctor and she says, you know, what was the prognosis? She says, well, yeah, he has cancer, but he's going to be around for another six months. You know, it's not a problem, you know. And, you know, we'll take good care of him, this and that. And you're a nurse, so you'll take good care of him. So she went back to him and said, oh, no, no, you're going to be fine. You know, don't worry, I'm here for you. He says, okay, well, whatever, dear, but I just wanted you to know that I apologize and I love you. Okay, fine. And then sure enough, he died that night. You know, incredible. So anyway, uh, interesting, isn't it? Like uh, that, that anybody who has any form of religion or spirituality has been so 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 blessed compared to just being materialistic and you know what I own and things like that. It's rather the the quality of my life, you know, who I am, where I'm coming from. Okay, so uh, we've taken Bodhichi and refuge, so uh, we're now going to go into the initiation. Uh, so there's three parts to this initiation. It's not initiation, it's called a permission, but the thing is looked as a, as a blessing. Uh, there's the blessing of the body. And so there'd be the blessing of body, speech, and mind. So uh, please take a comfortable posture. Okay. Uh, from my side, I've received the initiation. I should clarify that as a teacher, you need to qualify who you are. So I've received this initiation multiple, multiple times from Lama Yeshi, Lama Sopa. Of course, the big one for me was uh, who's His Holiness the Dalai Lama and such. So with uh, that, then I, I've received the initiation. I've done a retreat multiple times uh, and such. That's all that's required for doing this. Um, and then having done that, then uh, anyway, and then of course the Dalai Lama and 1988 gave me permission to give uh, Anatar initiations, but then he said also, actually, it was interesting. He said, like, you know, I, I Ling Rinpoche was my main guru, it died in 1983, or Parinirvana in 1983. So I couldn't ask him, although he had been my main guru during all of my retreats and all of my teachings. You know, I, I lived in India for 14 years and studied with all the Geshis and, and the various Lamas, but Ling Rinpoche was my primary teacher. So anyway, when he passed, uh, I didn't have anyone to ask, so I came back to Canada. And then in 1987, someone asked me to give them initiation, and I couldn't do it. I had no permission. So I went back to, I, we were on a trip to India. And at that point, you could still see his only, so it's just really nice, because nowadays it's almost impossible. Anyway, and so I got to see him, and I said, you know, see, someone's asked me to give initiations, and I need permission. And he paused for a moment, and he says, okay. <laughs> I was, okay, well, that was nice. And I, I tape recorded it, because... I, I knew that people were going to say, John, but you just made that up. But no, I'm sorry. He actually said it. Then I don't have the tape anymore, but thing. Uh, and then at any moment, he says, but, you know, if you give lower ones, you, they can't transform into the deity. They have to have anatory yoga. And I said, okay. And he says, and don't be arrogant. And I said, okay. So, so anyway, but I got permission. So that's on my side as the teacher. I have the initiations. I've done the retreats and I have permission from my teacher. Okay. Uh, for your side, uh, having a good heart. Um, you know, if you are a Buddhist, then fine, that's, you're just continuing with your normal practice. If you've never taken refuge or anything, uh, you can still take the practice. I mean, uh, Buddhas work for the benefit of all sentient beings, whether they're Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, or even they don't have any religion. Buddhas work for them. Uh, so the thing is, is that if you've never see, not received any uh, initiative or taken refuge, it's just fine. Don't worry, you can still do this and feel that you have a connection with Avalokiteshvara. So with that thought in mind, please take a comfortable posture. You should feel that in front of you is Avalokiteshvara. Uh, I've invoked Avalokiteshvara here, but you know what, what's nice is this is a live transmission. So that means all of you, wherever you are, we're all interdependent. We're all connected in one way or another. In this case, we're connected with both the internet and with our intention of being a bodhisattva working for the benefit of sentient beings. So with that thought in mind, then uh, feel that your body is hollow and in the center of your chest at the level of your heart is floating like a little light, which is sort of your light of good intentions. And what you do is you focus on that. Although you're, you, you should understand Avalokiteshvara and myself are witnessing you, but you need to express your feelings and thoughts. So. That's why, although, you know, I mean, you should just say, I, we're here, don't worry, we're watching you. But you only want to focus on your feelings because they're the things that transform you. So with that thought, like focus on your feelings, your body is clear like a crystal uh, floating at the level of your heart and the center of your chest is a light, which is your bodhicitta, your desire to become more enlightened to whatever extent you can. 
And please repeat after me. Buddhas of the three times. Buddhas, Buddhas of, of the three, three times. times. And the Vajra Master. And, and the, the Vajra, Vajra Master. Master. Please bestow the body initiation. Please bestow the body initiation. Of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Buddhas of the three times. Buddhas, Buddhas of the three times. And Vajra Master. And Vajra Master. Please bestow the body initiation. Please bestow the body initiation. Of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Buddhas of the three times and Vajra Master. Buddhas of the three times and Vajra Master. Please bestow the body initiation. Please bestow the body initiation. Of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Feel that the uh, Avalokiteshvara and I accept. Okay. Now uh, you follow just follow the the way that it's described uh, the 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 process of receiving uh, this blessing. Okay. So uh, there's what's called ultimate view and relative view of reality. Relative view is just everything around you: the walls, the doors, the computer, your chair you're sitting in, everything. That's just relative view. But if you understand it correctly, it's all interdependent, all a, a dynamic of, of causes and circumstances. It's always changing. Those are natural wisdoms that we have uh, uh, and such. So that's the relative view that I'm in a universe of dynamic, uh, changing flows of continuities of causes and circumstances and such like that. Ultimate view, though, is that your mind touches the nature of all those phenomena and everything you could say evaporates because everything is equally interdependent, empty of self-existence. So if your mind touched that equality, nothing can appear because it's all equal. It's like the whole world suddenly got painted white. There's no more, there's no more differentiations. It's just all white. In this case, it's clear light. Okay, so it becomes clear light. So when I say this mantra, I uh, feel that basically you've, you, you, we're all sitting in our relative, relative perspective of reality. You're going to evaporate into the ultimate nature of reality. Your mind focuses on the nature, which is open like the space of the sky. Okay, so feel that Om Sobhava Shudo Sarva Dharma Sobhava Shudo Hum. Om Sobhava Shudo Sarva Dharma Sobhava Shudo Hum. Just feel that you completely evaporate. There's nothing but open space of the sky. Then within that, have a little bit of a feeling. And you sit now, it's going to be positioned where your heart would be. But again, you're just open like the space of the sky. Feel a little drop of warmth comes. And it turns into the syllable hri. And that could be English, H-R-I-H. -H, or if you know what a Sanskrit one looks like, or the Tibetan one. But there's hri, and it's floating in space but it's got a very nice quality about it. And then feel that that starts to radiate and vibrate, and that turns into a little white tiggly, a little white dot, a dot with a little tail coming off of it. A little dot, it's white, it's radiant, and that's your mind. That's your most subtle mind. It's, your, it's actually your, your astral body or your, your manakaya or sambhogakaya. Okay. So rest in that for a sec. It's got nice feeling for the benefit of all. And now feel that in your heart, that like the, that then you you reanimate, you're back to relative perspective, but in your heart, that little tiggly turned into Avalokiteshvara, one face and four arms. So your body, remember you're, at the beginning of this, your body is clear like crystal and hollow. Now, that light that we talked about at the beginning became Avalokiteshvara, one face, two arms. And if you don't quite know what that looks like, just feel that there's a, you know, a, a male Buddha of love and compassion floating in your chest. Uh, and the first two hands are in front of his chest like this, holding a jewel. It's the wish-fulfilling jewel of love and compassion. It fulfills all wishes. That's the first two hands. And the two lower ones, which are the right and the left, uh, the right one has a rosary where he's pulling a crystal rosary where he's pulling the beads up, like pulling sentient beings out of a cyclic existence. 
And the left hand, lower one, has a white, is holding the stem of a white lotus, which is his purity. Uh, your, the feel that his face is very peaceful. He's floating in your art. He's so peaceful, but so, you know, enlightened, peaceful, wise. His eyes are very compassionate. It, his, he's wearing that, you know, the silk robes and, and such like that, the jewels of enlightenment. And on his crown, like a very little itty bitty Amitabha Buddha, his daddy. It's the daddy of this family, Amitabha Buddha, red Buddha. Uh, one face, two arms, is, is resting on his crown. And the two of them are completely surrounded, uh, this is in your heart, remember, are completely surrounded by light. Then feel that floating in their hearts, so now it's getting really teeny, but you, know, you have an ability to perceive that. So down very teeny, then you have a moon cushion appears in his heart. And standing in the center of it is the syllable hri, which is the sound, his seed syllable of, of love and compassion. And feel that in that sort of, that does a supernova thing and completely like light just flashes throughout the universe. And in all of our gurus, the Dalai Lama, Garshan Rinpoche, any gurus, even previous gurus that you might've had, they're up in the Pure Lands, they all become conscious of you. And they all come down and arise to be in front of you, observing you. So now feel that you, you're of your ordinary form. In your heart is floating Avalokiteshvara. In his heart is a moon cushion with a syllable Hri. This is rating a very beautiful white light. It's of course quite teeny. And then all around you are all of your gurus and the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. They all become conscious of you. Then feel that the guru, uh, that I, the guru, send light rays to the Avalokiteshvara, which is on the altar here, where I'm giving the initiation. And then feel that Avalokiteshvara, particularly there, but also he comes from Potala, which is his pure land. And all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas come. And then they immediately appear in front of you along with what you previously visualized. So now the whole space around you is full of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and they're all watching you, observing you. Om Vajrasama Ja. Feel that you're completely surrounded by them all. Feel that then they absorb into you. They completely absorb into you. Om Vajrasama Ja 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 Hum Bam Ho. They absorb into you. And you know, two things. If you've had an Anatario initiation, you turn into Avalokiteshvara. If you have not had an Anatario initiation, you merely feel that Avalokiteshvara in your heart becomes very, very radiant. So you, if you are Avalokiteshvara, you have one face, two arms. Even if you're a woman, you visualize yourself as a male deity. It's just fine. You have a very adaptable mind. We don't have any limitations. We men often visualize ourselves as Tara, so why not? So I am Avalokiteshvara, one face, two arms. My body is white, beautiful, radiant, very soft glow all around the skin and such like that. If you have not received Anatar initiation, then that's in your heart. Same to the family, doesn't really matter, no difference. And feel this way that you've received the initiation of the body of Avalokiteshvara, you have the potential of receiving, of becoming, having, of developing the Nirmanakaya, the body of manifestation of Avalokiteshvara. And you can also feel it like this is, you can bring to mind the people that you love, and this is for them. So even a more beautiful quality, a quality of, of empathy, love, and compassion come out of you radiant. So please continue, either you are Avalokiteshvara or Avalokiteshvara is floating in your heart. Okay, again, uh, you're to, to, I am going to witness you, you're going to re re request receiving a speech initiation. Please repeat after me. Buddhas of the three times and Vajra Master, 
Buddhas of the Three Times and Vajra Master. Please bestow on me the speech initiation. Please bestow on me the speech initiation of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Buddha of the Three Times and Vajra Master. Buddhas of the Three Times and Vajra Master. Please bestow on me the speech initiation. Please bestow on me the speech initiation of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Buddhas of the Three Times and Vajra Master. Buddhas of the Three Times and Vajra Master. Please bestow the speech initiation. Please bestow the speech initiation of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Feel okay then. Now please continue to meditate. Feel in front of you is floating Avalokiteshvara. He's manifested from here the, the, in the altar. He's in front of each one of you uh, without, any, without any problem or hindrance. Now, in his heart and in your heart, so, okay, if you're Avalokitesh Bar, it's in your heart, there's a floating moon disc. If you've not received Anatar initiation, then in the heart of Avalokitesh Bar, in your chest, in his heart, there comes a moon cushion with a syllable Hri standing on it. Now, from I am Avalokitesh Bara, the Avalokitesh Bara in front of you, and then in, in you as Avalokitesh Bara, but in, for myself and the Avalokitesh Bara in front of you, on their moon cushions, of my moon cushion, there's the mantra, Om Mani Padme Home, going clockwise, it's radiant white, and it has like little, like has light like fire around it, like a, a flame of a candle. So as I repeat this, Please feel that out of my mouth and out of the mouth of Avalokiteshvara, who's floating in front of you, comes a little flame of an individual syllable. It goes into your mouth and comes down and sits in your heart. Om would be at the front part of your chest. Mani, Padme, Hum would go around to back to the back of the right side, around to the left side, and back to the front. Okay, so that's how the syllables go. So visualize it coming from Avalokiteshvara in the space in front of you. And, and from myself, the mantra, please repeat after me and feel the little flame comes in your mouth. Om. Om. Mani. Mani. Padme. Padme. Hum. Hum. Om. Om. Mani. Mani. Padme. Padme. Hum. Hum. Om. Om Mani Mani Padme Padme Hum Hum Feel you have tingling in your heart and feel that the uh, with the third recitation the syllables which are little flames on the moon cushion in your heart or the heart of Avalokiteshvara in your heart are, are vibrating and stable they're not going anywhere Okay then all together we'll just do mantra many times Okay. Feel that in your heart there's a radiation of this light energy, like pulsations of light that fill, for example, Avalokiteshvara in your heart, if you did that, or you as Avalokiteshvara just radiating your bodies is transparent, as clear, as hollow, and is uh, filled with nothing but the bodhicitta. Feel your body is like crystal or glass, but it's just the, the surface of your skin, the inside of you is hollow, but filled with light. Even if, you, if you're if you not identifying with Avalokiteshvara, you can do that. But in the center of your chest, if you if you have, that's where Avalokiteshvara is, then he's resting there, but your body still is clear, hollow skin. If you are Avalokiteshvara, then you have a radiant body and inside is hollow, and in, the, in your heart is the moon cushion with the money coming home and free. Okay, now, um, there's not a, let's say, 
when I received this, I promised the Dalai Lama that I would do 100 of Mani Padme Home every day. Now, uh, that's not including sadhanas or anything. So again, um, and this doesn't mean that you have to be sitting on a meditation mat. You can do this anytime you want. So I would recommend that take a, a commitment at least to say Mani Padme Home once. But of course, if you can do 100 a day, that would be really good. Uh, so I'm asking that of you at least say it once a day. If not, please say it 100. And if you say it a million times a day, of course, that's wonderful too. Okay, please repeat after me. Avalokiteshvara and Vajra Master. Avalokiteshvara and Vajra Master. Please pay attention to me. Please pay attention to me. I, say your name. I. From now until the attainment of enlightenment. From now until the attainment of enlightenment. Will hold Arya Avalokiteshvara dear. Will hold Arya Avalokiteshvara dear. I promise and commit myself. I promise and commit myself to recite in the number of mantras you have in your mind. To recite daily. Okay. Okay. Uh, Avalokit and Vajra Master. Avalokiteshvara and Vajra Master. Please pay attention to me. Please pay attention to me. I say your name. I. From now until the attainment of enlightenment. From, from now, now until the attainment, the attainment of enlightenment. Will hold Arya Avalokiteshvara. Will hold Arya Avalokiteshvara. As my special deity. As my special deity. I promise and commit myself. I promise and commit myself. To recite. To recite. Mantras daily. Mantras daily. Okay, um, I've witnessed you. Now, again, if you don't do that, don't feel you're, you're not going to go to Vajra hell, but the thing is, it is good. And Lama Yeshi had a really nice way of talking about it. He said a mantra is like a, a cell phone number for a Buddha. Okay, and this in particular applies, for example, to Tara practice. I mean, Tara can be very much uh, present in your life. And so a mantra is her cell phone number. And same thing with Omani Padme Home, Avalokiteshvara, that's his cell phone number. So if you recite it, one, of course, you should vibrate and fill yourself up with the energy of Avalokiteshvara that may all sentient beings have happiness, the cause of happiness, may all sentient beings be free of suffering. You can do that. But you should also feel that you are attracting Avalokiteshvara more in your life. And so therefore, compassion and empathy and, and love are more part of who you are. Of course, with intelligence, I, I somehow always need to feel a need to say that, that, you know, be full of love, but you also have to exercise intelligence. OK, so uh, you've done that uh, feel. Now you've received the blessing of Avalokiteshvara and it's called the lineage. Uh, this lineage came from from myself, from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, but also I received it, as I said, from uh, Lama Yeshi and many other Tibetan Lamas. OK, uh, so then just uh, the final thing is say, um, just say this. Uh, teacher, please hold me dear. 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 Okay, so <clears throat> then it is in the text it says, uh, all the Tatha goddess, hold these, please hold these students very dear. Okay, actually, you don't need to repeat that. Okay, sorry. So the, the teacher says to all the Tathagatas of the Ten Directions, please hold you, the students, dear. May these students that hold this practice, may their minds and their speech be blessed. Feel that the mantra completely becomes one with the, with the nature of your being and the level of your heart. And feel that any negativities of speech in the past that you might have accumulated are purified. And you receive the holy speech of the Buddha Avalokiteshvara. And it has the 60 harmonics. Okay, I mean, this means that when the Buddha speaks, it's just beautiful to listen to. Okay. No. So anyway, of course, realistically, you know, I mean, we're going to go and step outside and we're going to say something gross or inappropriate. You know what happens, isn't it? So, but the thing is, at least, you know, you know, okay, well, I don't want to repeat that. That's uh, the, the most simple version of purification is, oh, that was inappropriate. I don't want to do that again. 
So there's no guilt. It's just on the basis of maybe an unpleasant word or something like that, on the basis of that, I say, I don't want to do that again. That, that's the most simplistic version of the four powers of, of purification. You know, the, uh, I regret, I take refuge, I do a purification, and uh, I dedicate. Okay, so that's the most simple version. And it's quite easy. I mean, it's not too complicated. And if you do that, I mean, again, it's not like you beat yourself up. You just say, I, I'm not going to do that again. You know, and then you, you try to help that. Now, again, if you do it again, of course, you say, okay, I'm going to try hard. I'm not going to do that again. Okay. So uh, so then that concludes the initiation of speech. Now we have the initiation of mind. Okay. So please repeat after me. Again, you have Avalokitesh Bar in front of you. Avalokitesh Bar is witnessing you. I, the teacher, am witnessing you. Buddhas of the three times and Vajra Master. Buddhas of the three times and Vajra Master. Please bestow the mind initiation. Please bestow the mind initiation. Of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Buddhas of the three times. Buddhas of the three times. And Vajra Master. And Vajra Master. Please bestow the mind initiation. Please bestow the mind initiation. Of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Buddhas of the three times and Vajra Master. Buddhas of the three times and Vajra Master. Please bestow the mind. Please bestow the mind of initiation. The mind initiations. Please bestow the mind initiation of Avalokiteshvara. Of Avalokiteshvara. Okay. Uh, now you should feel that from me and from Avalokiteshvara, who's floating in front of you, wherever you are, that light starts to come out of their body, and it turns into into various things. It turns into a string of the mantra money Padme home and white lotuses that are floating around Avalokiteshvara and floating around me. And feel that these start to rain upon your body. So, you know, just feel that like there's, from Avalokiteshvara comes a great rain of mantras and white lotuses. They rain upon your body. They completely, your body becomes clear, more clear. It's hollow, radiant. Feel that all the negativities, misunderstanding of your minds are completely removed. Your mind is so clear. And then just feel everything starts to evaporate and you arrive at clear light consciousness. That's your Buddha nature. It's a state of consciousness with no form. And then as you reanimate your form, feel you're there for the benefit of all sentient beings. You are bodhicitta. From your Buddha nature, your dharmakaya, you that's your personal liberation. When you manifest, it's only bodhicitta. So you turn into free, and then you turn into yourself, forearm, double again, as far, one face, two arm, four arms. You have a very blissful body, very nice feeling. And it's all in the nature of bodhicitta. And you've now received the seed to attain dharmakaya of all the buddhas, okay? So that completes the body, speech, and mind initiation. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so that... Uh, now, I can't come around and do the vase on the crown of your heads, which would have been if you were personally here. But I uh, just feel that I now take a vase and on the crown of your head, I touch it. And you feel sort of a thrill through your body. And you've received now the Initiation of the body, speech, and mind of Avalokiteshvara. You've also received the Vays initiation, which is part of that. And that concludes the uh, process. Okay, so. Okay. Thank you so very much, Lama Champa. We would like to offer you a mandala for receiving. We don't need to end just yet, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
you know, now I just want to talk a little bit about uh, about you know, okay, we're we're trying to we're trying to be bodhisattvas. We're trying to work for the benefit of sentient beings and stuff like that. So it, we should try to take uh, like we have that intention. So if you can in your whatever country you live in or wherever you are, if you could, if you know some holy person comes, you know, I mean, the Dalai Lama is a big one, of course, but then there's also uh, many other Lamas that are really quite precious. And then there's even lay teachers, which are, are quite precious, you know, and, or maybe you know of somebody who's a Buddhist who's done a lot of practice and stuff like that. Um, seek them out if they're in your area or it's not too far away because you're accumulating karma and you did something. You, you made an effort because of your wish to have more bodhicitta in your being you made an effort to go and see this person. And if you can, if they're a teacher, request bodhisattva vows. Now, uh, for myself, I think I, I, the other day I talked about Kunalama Tenzin Gelson. Uh, he's incredible. I mean, he he was completely, you know, he was in Tibet prior to the Chinese invasion. He studied with the Nyingma Kargu Gelusaki at all four lineages. Uh, you know, he was actually from India. He was from the Kulu Valley, which is part of India and stuff. And he spoke fluent Tibetan and everything like that. Just this really small little guy. Anyway, and so he did all of that. Then the Chinese invaded, so he came back to India. And of course, in India, it's his home country. And, and it's a little bit different than Tibet. I mean, in Tibet, you know, you can't wander around and just sleep on the street because it's freezing cold and you die. But in India, you can do that. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I used to have to sleep in train stations on the concrete ground, you know, just because, you know, I was only in my 20s, but, you know, you could do that because it's just, it's a different country. And so anyway, Kunalama came back to India and he was really renounced. He didn't have anything. He didn't have trappings of anything like that. He just re really think, in fact, he wasn't even ordained as a monk. And I'll explain that in a second. So anyway, he then, because it's India, he went around and there wasn't a lot of Buddhist temples. So he go around to Hindu temples. And so he would go and stay in a Hindu temple here for a while, another one there. And he finally ended up in Benares. Uh, you know, the, you know, the home ground of, of you know, the Ganges River and, and uh, Shiva and Parvati and stuff like that. And he was staying in a, in a Mahadeva temple. OK, so uh, Hachan, OK, from yesterday, someone asked that. So from Mahadeva. So he was staying there in a little room and in a Hindu temple, you know, and he was just doing his stuff. Anyway, uh, the Dalai Lama, who knew of him uh, and such, was, was really wanted him. And so the Dalai Lama, you know, again, they were refugees and the Dalai Lama would have been like when I met the Dalai Lama, I was 20. He was 35 years old. It's incredible, you know, like, I mean, 35 year old man. Anyway, so this means he was like 30 or even 27 years old when this was happening. But he knew that Kunalama Tinsen Galson was an incredible being. In fact, I mean, he, he the Kunalama taught His Holiness, gave him uh, teachings and such on Bodhicitta. Uh, and so he was one of the Dalai Lama's gurus, which is like puts you in a whole nother level. I mean, you know, like he was the guru of the Dalai Lama, not just like a student. Anyway, so uh, as, a, as a story goes, then uh, the Dalai Lama found out where he was. So he came to Benares. Then, of course, they, they were they were arrived at the Hindu temple. I mean, there wouldn't have been a being under rush at that point because the Dalai Lama wasn't famous or anything, you know. And so the attendant came up and and the, the, there was a little cell where Kunalama was in and he knocked on the door and, and, and Kunalama said, yes, you know, and he says, well, you know, the Dalai Lama would like to like to meet you. And he said, well, I'm, I'm just here. I, I don't want to leave. I'm sorry. I'm very happy to be here. And he says, no, no, the Dalai Lama is downstairs. <laughs> and so the Dalai Lama came up. And he made three prostrations. And I don't know if he maybe offered a mandala. And he said, please, Kunalama Tinsing Elson, can you please teach some of the uh, young monks and, and such uh, for us refugees? And so that was uh, just an example of, of Kunalama, like completely renounced. So anyway, I, I'd heard these stories. And then there's the book, which is the um, Praise of Bodhicitta. Uh, a friend of mine, Gareth Sparham's translated it. It's 100 or 360 plus verses of praise. Every day for a year, Kunalama Tenzin Gelsen, who was quite good with you know Sanskrit and Tibetan and such, he wrote a poem to 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 Bodhicitta. And so I mean, yes, yeah, some of them are a bit you know funky, but this, <laughs> but you know, I guess some days he was more inspired than others. But it's beautiful. Um, it, you can get it off Amazon, I think. It's Praise of Bodhicitta, Gareth Sparham, uh, Kunalama Tenzin Gelsen, okay, uh, and such. So anyway, there's that. So I thought, wow, I mean, this guy is holy, you know, and I mean, he's not just holy living in a palace or something like that because he's a Dalai Lama's guru. 
you know, he was living in a mud hut in Sopema. So I, I told us the other day, I went there, I, I went there with a, a, another Tibetan monk and, and we finally found him. He was in this little mud hut on the second floor, this dirt, you know, slate stones and slate roof with wind blowing through it. He was sitting in a corner with a blanket wrapped around him. And this is the famous Kunalama Tenzing Yeltsin. And his glasses were were so thick, like they're the, the, like the thickness of a Coke, Coke bottle, you know, the bottom of a Coke bottle, like, I mean, that. And he had almost no teeth, you know, and he's, he's wrapped up and he's sort of just sitting there, you know, it's cold because I mean, I don't remember what month it was, but it was cold. And the cadre was his attendant, she was there. Anyway, so we came up and we did three prostrations. And at that point, um, you know, I actually had a, a little gold coin made. And the, the goldsmith in Darmstadt, and this time, I mean, gold was maybe worth a couple hundred dollars an ounce at that point. So don't remember the detail, but he he put a Dharma chakra on it, like the, the goldsmith. I said, Oh, I'm going to go see Kunalama Tenzing Gelson. You know, I want to offer him gold because he's, he's a Buddha, he's a Bodhisattva. You know, I, I want karma with this guy. So he said, okay. And then he said, okay, and then we put the little Dharma chakra in it and stuff like that. So we did three prostrations. I offered him gold. I didn't have to say it was gold. I just offered him that uh, and such. And then I said, please, can you, uh, uh, can you give us, uh, can you uh, give us a transmission of the first verse of the Bodhisattva guide? And can you please give us Bodhisattva vows? So just from his memory, he rattled off the, the first verse of the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. And then he gave us Bodhisattva vows and stuff like that. And then, then what happened was my biggest regret. He said, oh, if you want to stay, I'll teach you. <laughs> and I said, oh, I've got to go back to Dharamsala. <laughs> I shoot myself in the head, you know, twit. Anyway, but the point is, is, is that like, I think, and, and so then part of it, so then we, we sat there and he was chatting with us a little bit. I mean, luckily I had the Tibetan with me because my Tibetan, although it's good, it's not that good. So um, Lama Glenn always teases me and he says, John, but if there's a part of Tibet called Canada, that's where your accent comes from. Because I have a really bad Tibetan accent. Now I can't even speak to it anymore. It's been 20 years in Mexico. But anyway, so he was talking away with us. And then at one point he said, because we were both monks at that point. I was, a, we were both what called Gilong or monks. And he said, oh, tell me, how many vows do you have? And, you know, and Nindak, who was with me, that was a Tibetan and myself, he said, well, 253. And I says, oh, he says, I have eight precepts, you know, the, the layman's, the, it's, it's called the, the layman's ordination. Like, you, know, you can have five precepts, and then you have three more, uh, which is a little bit more strict. He says, I have eight precepts. I can protect my eight precepts. Could you? <laughs> that was the end of our meeting. <laughs> so, I mean, like, okay, so we... He also punched you when, when it was necessary. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, my point being is, is that, for example, if you could go to Kathmandu, or remember, I mean, Kathmandu, there's Swayambhunath, there's uh, uh, um, uh, Boda, stupas, do prostrations, you know, I mean, those places have just, they've been loaded with 2,000 years of spiritual energy. And then, of course, Budgaya. Now, Budgaya, when I was there, had no nothing around it. You could walk in from any side of the fence and you could do your prostrations and you get a prostration board, which you can still do. But now it's a lot more controlled. So it's lost some of the, the beauty of it. But still, if you could go to Budgaya where Buddha became enlightened, there's still the, well, it's a, a branch off of the original Bodhi tree uh, there and stuff. And just like this is where the Buddha became enlightened. This is the source of bodhicitta. This is the bodhi tree. And even like one prostration to that, with that in your mind, is just incredible. I mean, it's the karma like inconceivable, let alone if you could spend a couple months there and do prostrations or something like that. And I'm not saying that you need to do this, but if you have the luxury and the peace and the, and the space to do it, do something. And maybe you only do it there for a week and you do prostrations or something, that's fine. But you're, you're doing, uh, prostrations aren't, penance they are admiration and bliss for who the buddha is you know i mean it, like wow I, I would love to throw myself at the feet of the buddha shakyamuni and and such like that i mean just to get the karma of that so you've now all got avalokiteshvara initiation it's all about bodhicitta it's about developing you know wisdom with empathy and compassion and love okay so that's the practice you uh, there's sadhanas i think uh they can uh visit uh, jonish and and Gosha can share a sadhana with you. You can, of course, find lots of sadhanas. Any sadhana you wish to do is fine. Uh, your commitment is just no money, pay me home. You don't need to do a sadhana, so don't worry about that. 
Uh, you know, so there's no money coming home. So when you're walking around, when you're in your car, when you're in a bus, you can say, I'm money coming home. That completes the commitment with me. If you were to forget, don't worry. It's not going to take a bad rebirth, but it's like you lost the cell phone number. So next day, please phone them again. Okay. So uh, those are just my closing thoughts for this. Uh, you've received a good initiation. Um, I, I can't say I'm anything, but I have very good lineage, you know, from very good people. So I'm glad to share that with you all. Okay, so uh, anyway, that so that does conclude the initiation and everything now. Okay, so thank you very, 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 very much. I uh, hope you will practice very well and such like that. And uh, of course, then um, if you are in Europe, I will be in Ireland in April with Jonas and Joshua. We'll be doing uh, the uh, the Mah Ganges Mahamudra, which would be a six, seven days of, of just uh, ultimate nature. But of course, it'll be focused around good practice. So that's something if you want. Here in Mexico, um, we do retreats every year for 10 days in silence. Uh, I lead them still and I'm 73, but I can still manage. <laughs> I don't fall asleep on this on the on the throne too much. <laughs> anyway, so so the thing I'm wondering how much longer I can do it, but I'm doing pretty good. I I, I sort of careful, you know. But anyway, so um, uh, those are things that you want to attend personally. But I I don't I'm not I'm I'm very happy that I'm not very popular because if I was, then I would be able to be with you guys and chat and things like that. You know, the worst thing that could happen to your guru is that they become popular. Okay, so uh, with that then, let's do the uh, Mandela offering and dedication. So I don't know if you have some dedication prayers for the screen. If you don't, don't worry, we can just do, a, we'll do it, in, or do it in Tibetan, okay? So Mandela offering, please. Sashi Perky Jokshik so thank you very much to all of my teachers that gave me these teachings and thank you very much to all of you so we're all just a big ocean of interdependence and may we benefit sentient beings in this world around us thank you very very much thank you so very much lama Trumpa. thank you all for tuning in uh, maybe as a finishing comment, it was on donation basis. So if you find benefit, please send us a donation via PayPal to Lama Jampa. That would be very nice for the karmic connection. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also, of course, I mean, a donation to uh, Jonas and uh, Gosha for, for being able to do this. And, uh, and of course, um, I'll take care of Alan, who's a translator, because he's precious. So all the people who did it in Spanish. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Big hugs. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm looking at some of your faces. I know some of you. you know. <laughs> James, Jury, uh, Al, Do, Doma, Doma, Goj, Goma, Goj, Kidru. Okay. Uh, Guy, Tom Brown. Hi, Tom from Canada. Nice to see you. Okay. Anyway, so big hugs, guys. That's it. Uh, lots and lots of love. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.